Hello everyone, my name is Jason Gregerson, and in this video we're going to introduce the orthogonal complement. So we've seen so far that vectors can be orthogonal if u dot v is equal to zero. But the next question would be, can vectors be orthogonal to a set of vectors, not just an individual vector? And furthermore, can two sets of vectors be orthogonal, and what would that mean exactly? So let's define both of those cases. So to find both of those situations, we can see first that a vector u is considered orthogonal to a set of vectors, v, if u is orthogonal to every vector in v. So let's make this explicit. So if v is a set of vectors, v1, v2, v3, for instance, then we would say that u is orthogonal to the set v, if and only if u is perpendicular to every vector. So in this case, it'd be perpendicular to v1, that vector. These are three vectors here. But you would also have to be perpendicular to v2. And you would also have to be perpendicular to v3. So if it's perpendicular to every vector in the set, then we say it's perpendicular to the set. Furthermore, the set of all vectors, the set of all vectors orthogonal to every vector in v, is called the orthogonal complement of V. And we'll write that, well, that orthogonal complement of V like this, this will be our notation for it. And the way we read that is called V perp. So this is V perp, the orthogonal complement of V. So now let's look at an example. So we're working with vectors in R3. So we're looking at R3 as our main vector space. And then we're gonna look at the subspace V, which is a set of all vectors, that's what we have here, the set of all vectors, such that v is equal to some constant times the vector 1, 0, 0. So really, we're looking at a subspace that has a basis of 1, 0, 0. Now, what does that look like? Well, I've drawn 1, 0, 0 on my three-dimensional coordinate system. It's this vector. So if I look at all the multiples of that vector, it would be this vector, or this vector, or this vector. Or if you multiply by a negative value, it would be these vectors. So essentially, I have all the vectors that are on this line. Now I have some other subspace, which I'm calling W here. And W is a set of all vectors, X I'm calling them now, that are multiples of this vector, 0, 1, 0. So that vector would look like, here's 0, 1, 0. And all the multiples would look like this line. And so my first question is, is W the orthogonal complement? Well, if I take any vector in W, let's grab one. Let's grab this one. We'll call that vector 0, 2, 0. Clearly, that is a vector that's in W. Now, that vector is orthogonal to the vector V. So in other words, if I take any multiple of 1, 0, 0, I take the dot product of that with 0, 2, 0, the result will be 0. They really will be perpendicular to each other. So I would say that this vector is orthogonal to the set V. However, W is not necessarily the orthogonal complement to V, because there's lots of other vectors that are also orthogonal to W. For instance, what about this vector? This could be the vector 0, 0, 1. That is also orthogonal to V. So we talk about the orthogonal complement of V, V perp, I need the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to V. Now in this case, this vector would be orthogonal to V, so would this one, so would this one, so would this one, so would any of the vectors in the YZ plane. So to make W the orthogonal complement of V, I would have to consider that whole plane. So maybe I add all the x vectors that are a linear combination of 0, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 1. So now if I find this to be w, so now I can say that w is equal to v perp. So this is how we kind of describe the orthogonal complement. Now I want to look at one really important theorem about orthogonal complements. OK, now let's look at a key theorem. The theorem says that given some a, this is an m by n matrix, that the orthogonal complement of the row space of A is equal to the null space of A. Or another way to say that would be the orthogonal complement of the column space of A would be equal to the null space of A transpose. Now really, these two things are saying the same thing. For instance, if instead of using A, as we defined our theorem, we used A transpose instead, we would get this. 
but the row space of a matrix is just the linear combination of the rows of A. But if I look at a transpose, where the columns have been turned into rows and the rows have been turned into columns, then the linear combinations of the rows of A transpose are really just the linear combination of the columns of A. Thus, this is the same thing as saying the column space of A perp is equal to the null space of A transpose, which is our second statement. So really, these two things are saying exactly the same thing. Now, what about a proof of this? Well, the reason this is an important proof because it helps us to see a pattern of proofs. And not only it talks about how to and not only justifies a statement, but we can see how to show the two sets of vectors are equal. Because the null space of A is a set of vectors, and the orthogonal complement to the row space is also a set of vectors. So how do we show that two sets are equal? Well, we have to show that if X is in one set, that it automatically belongs to the other. And if it's in the other, it must belong in the first. We have to show both of those things. So more formally, we need to show two things. We need to show that, one, if x is in the row space of A perp, then x must be in the null space of A. That would be the first thing to show. Then we have to show that, two, that if x was in the null space of A, then x would have to be in the row space of A perp. So by showing both of those things, then we can show that those two sets of vectors are equal. So let's start off with the first one. If x is in the row space of A perp, what exactly does that mean? That means that if some vector v is in the row space of A, and if it's in the row space, then it must be a linear combination of the rows. I'm going to use r1 to be the first row of A, and I'll use r2 to be the second row of A, so on and so forth, until I have the last row of A. So I have the last row of A. Then if x is in the row space perp, that x must be perpendicular to every v. All the v's can be written like that. And if they're perpendicular to x, then that means the dot product of x and v would have to be equal to 0. Well, what does this dot product look like? It looks like x dotted with this big expression. And all these are rows, once again, of a, but then because it have the distributive property of the dot product and also the associative property of scalar multiplication, I can rewrite this as the first constant times x dot r1 plus the second constant times x dot r2, so on and so forth. And this is supposed to be equal to 0 if x is in the orthogonal complement of the row space. Now, the important thing here is just because this is true does not necessarily mean that all these dot products are equal to 0. But because this is true for every v in the row space, in other words, for any possible combination of these c1c2s, the only way for that always to be true really is if each one of those dot products is equal to 0 individually. So the reason this statement is true is because this statement was true for any vector v. So now they know that if x is in the row space of A perp, that all these things are true. But what exactly does that tell us? Well, let's look back and think about matrix multiplication. Here I have A, which is my m by n matrix, and I'm multiplying it by some vector x, for instance, which is an n by 1. Now if I look at a little matrix A over here, where I have some values, and I'm just going to use a little example to demonstrate the point here. And I have some x1, x2, x3. Well, one way I can do that multiplication is by the row vector multiplication technique, which has my first row of my solution would be a11 times x1 plus a12 times x2 plus a13 times x3, and then I'll do the same thing for this next value. But what I can see here when I actually write that out, that this thing is really just the dot product of my first row dotted with my vector x. And so I can really think of matrix multiplication as this process of taking dot products with rows. 
So what that means is this multiplication is really just some big vector that looks like the dot product of x with each one of these rows. But if x but if x is in the row space of a perp, then each one of these dot products is equal to 0, which means all these values of z are equal to 0, which tells me that x is in the null space of a, since it's a solution to the homogeneous equation. So thus I've shown that x must be in the null space of a. So we started out by saying if x is in the orthogonal complement of the row space, we've shown that same x must be in the null space of a. So that's showing number one. But now to show number two, we can actually just use this whole argument backwards. We can say that if x is in the null space of a, then it must be a solution to the homogeneous equation. So ax must be equal to zero, which would tell us that each one of these values is equal to zero. And we simply work our way back up to show that x is in the orthogonal complement of the row space of a. So we can just reverse this order to show that number two, that two is correct. And once we've shown one and two, we can say that yes, these two sets of vectors really are equal. So that was kind of a quick sketch of the proof of this key theorem. And that concludes this video on orthogonal complements. Thank you.